so John tells us how to read the book of Revelation, right? Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. So it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So you can see there it's a revelation from God given to Jesus to be revealed to his servants, that is all the believers, the things that will soon take place. So it's the things that will soon take place that people are confused about. And so some people come into book Revelation and looking into it and trying to interpret it as if this is how things would, would to happen consecutively. But I don't think a book of Revelation is written like that. And I will show you that the structures of the the structure of our lectures for this uh, for this class would give you just a hint of how to read this because it there are certain cycles, repeated cycles. So, for example, we'll be looking today at the seven lampstands and the seven stars. That's uh, chapters one to three. And next week, we'll be looking at chapter four to seven, and that's the seven seals, right? And all these things, uh, the, the, the uh, seven lampstands and the seven stars, it, talk, it speaks to the church, right? And I think today uh, gives us the historical context of the book. The book was written to a particular uh, people in a particular historical context. And you got to, um, to imagine how they themselves would have understood the book. Okay? And that's what we're trying to do. And that's what I'm saying. Um, the, the only um, help they had received in the first century in order to understand the symbols that John had used is the Old Testament. And the New Testament. Uh, Revelation was written towards the end of the first century, probably in the 90s, 96, 95, by the Apostle John. He was, he, as he tells us, he's uh, in, in the uh, island of Patmos uh, because of the persecution that was happening at the time. Um, uh, and so, 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 so the book, it, 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 um, it starts off with that, uh, chapter one to three, that's the historical context. When we move to chapter 4 to 7, we look at the seven seals, as, as we shall see, it begins in heaven and finishes with judgment. It's almost like uh, this is the heavenly perspective of how you should live your life before judgment. Right? And then after that, we move to chapters 8 all the way to 14. right? And that's the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets starts in chapter 8, chapter 9, and then finishes off with chapter 14 with judgment again. So there's judgment in chapter 6 and 7. There's judgment in chapter 14. right? And then you move from there to chapter 15 all the way to chapter 18. right? And it begins with the seven bowls of judgment, the last judgment of God, and finishes with the judgment, again, right? the judgment of Babylon in chapter 17, 18. Um, and uh, and then you move on to chapters 19 and, and 20, where you see, again, the whole picture, uh, it starts with, um, I presume, it starts with a new covenant in Christ, the new covenant of marriage between the Lamb uh, and, and his church. And that's the covenant that Jesus made when he died, right? Uh, and starts with that. And then we live in the in the millennium. That's what, where we are now. And then it finishes off with judgment. So it seems to me that there are cycles um, you know, these cycles, chapters uh, 4 to 7, chapters 8 to 14, chapters 15 to, uh, to 20, all these cycles end up in judgment. And I take it that the book is really about how to endure hardship as people uh, who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how to endure uh, hardships and persevere in the name of Jesus, for the name of Jesus, holding on to the word of God, and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ until we reach judgment when Jesus returns and destroys all the hindrances uh, that, that are, are, go, are going against us right now. So, but anyway, coming back to, to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. So from Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, we can see that this book is a revelation of Jesus Christ given to him by God to show us believers. So this book is for us believers, right? Uh, sometimes we then do think, oh, it's for the experts. The book is for the experts who would know what this means. No, it's not for the experts. This book is for the believers uh, because it is a book that gives us, uh, that uh, reveals to us symbolically how we ought to endure hardships and persevere for the word of God, holding on to the word of God 
and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, would they take it to be the gospel until Jesus returns? Because he says that's what he that's what's about to happen, right? I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, was, who is to come. So he is to come, right? So that's what's about, that's what soon what will soon take place is he is to come, right? And then you go to the end of the book, to chapter 22, verse 12. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. You go to the last, um, or the second last verse of the book. He who testifies about these things say, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So really clear that uh, the book is really the, to prepare us believers, to help us believers endure because Jesus is coming soon, right? And it's um, it's it has been soon ever since the book was written in the first century, and it's still soon today, because you remember what Peter says about um, you know timing, a thousand years is just one year, uh, sorry, one day, uh, in heaven's perspective. Eh? Now the book is to be made known symbolically, and that's this word here. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Now, that word, make known, uh, the second make known, is not the normal word in Greek that is used for revealing, right? Uh, as it is used in the revelation from God revealed to Jesus Christ. This word can, can also mean it's made known symbolically. It's the word that is used in the gospel about Jesus is doing signs. Like in the gospel, John you know, it says that this is the first sign that Jesus did, right? It's the same word, right? Uh, semeon, semeon, semaphore, that's the word in Greek. Okay? So the way to read this book is to read it symbolically. That is, it's a book of symbols, right? Uh, but it's also a prophecy. Now, a prophecy is not to do with the future. I think um, whenever the word prophecy is mentioned, people's mind that race towards the future. But you think about the prophets of the Old Testament. You think about Isaiah, Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. They were speaking words to their own historic time, right? They were speaking the word of God to their own historical time. And it was the same as this, right? Of course, it has some implication for future as well, because God promises that he will again restore Israel, bring them back to their land, raise them from their graves, and that sort of thing. It looks to the, looks to the future, but it is the God's word for the time, for the present time. It's the same with this. It's, it, I don't mean so people just think about, oh, it's a word of course for present time. So it means that you look to Russia or China. No, not that, right? It's exactly how you read Isaiah. You read Isaiah as a word that was spoken to his historical con, um, you know, contemporary. And then you interpret it to us through Jesus Christ. It's just the same as the revelation. But it is the word of God given for us believers to prepare us, right? for the coming judgment when Jesus returns. So a summary is that Revelation is a word of God, right? It's a prophecy revealed symbolically. And I want to underline this symbolically, right? Um, it's revealed symbolically to believers through Jesus' angel. That is, there are a lot of symbols in this book. Now, how can we, so, so the question then is how to understand these symbols? And I will, always, I will point you to the Old Testament, Old Testament texts and passages, even New Testament text passages that will help us to understand this book, right? So the symbols are to be understood from the rest of the Bible, right? The Old Testament and the New Testament. So you know how I, I hear people uh, interpreting uh, things like Revelation 9, you have, um, you know, something like uh, the, the, there is this thing like scorpions are coming out of the peace. And I take it, it's, it's a, you know, this is the poisonous uh, evil forces from hell that is taking, that is coming, that is affecting the unbelievers. Chapter 9 of Revelation, we will see it. But some people interpret it to be helicopters. And you know how in, in chapter 11, for example, uh, there is the, um, the two witnesses, the chapter about the two witnesses, and they're being killed. And it says that the whole world was looking into it. And... I think the most popular interpretation of it, it will be through television and satellites that we will be able to... To me, it's laughable, right? When you think about how good the people in the first century would have understood this, right? 
um, because it's really about it's a symbolic way of 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 you know depicting how this world look at the death of unbelievers of or sorry the death of believers especially people who are who are running the prophetic ministry of proclaiming the word of God right we look at, they look at us with mockery uh, they they look at us with they they enjoy they rejoice when we when we fall and that's the sort of, but anyway what I'm basically saying is all those interpretations should be considered as misinterpretation of the of of revelation we must look at the old testament and new testament in order to understand what John was talking about to the people of his own time, in order then for us now to be able to understand what he's saying to them and to us. So Revelation is a prophetic symbol, like what Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember uh, in Daniel 2, um, 28, um, Daniel, you know, was interpreting, you remember the, the Nebuchadnezzar's dream that we look at in uh, lesson, I think it's when we when we did the look X, you know, Daniel's, uh, you know, big, the image, the image of this, um, you know, the man of golden head and uh, and then legs and stuff, and then and and then Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was looking at this vision like us looking at the book of Revelation, and then Daniel said to um, Nebuchadnezzar, "There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and He has let King Nebuchadnezzar know what will happen in the last days. Your dream and the visions that came into your mind as you lay in bed were these. And then he explains, and these are about the four empires that will be coming through. And then the last empire, the fourth empire we saw was Rome. You know, some people even believe that Rome will be restored. Rome will never be restored. Because Rome was meant to be the fourth empire that will kill Jesus. And that's it. But people read the book of Revelation and think that, you know, the row, you know, the seven kings, I think in chapter 17 says that there are some who have, hasn't been raised or something and think that, that Rome will never be restored, right? We know that from, from Daniel, right? Because it was meant to be the fourth kingdom. And during that fourth kingdom, the Messiah will come and they will kill the Messiah, right? And that's what exactly what happened. Okay. okay. But it's symbols, right? Just as Nebuchadnezzar saw this big vision of the big image, and then Daniel had to explain to him, right? We too are looking at images, and the, the, the rest of the Bible, that is God through the rest of the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament, reveal it to us. So what King Nebuchadnezzar saw was mystery of what must take place in the last days, that is our days. We live in the last days, let me remind you. The last days is the period between the first coming of Jesus and his second coming. So this is 2024. Of the last days okay you must remember that the last days um this is according to your testament to the new testament sorry is uh you know after jesus now jesus has died has come fulfilled all prophecies died rose again and is now ruling from the kingdom of god okay it's a revelation is prophetic symbols like what nathan tells king david remember what he told king david you know the story he told you know, the rich man with a very large flock uh, and the poor man had nothing except one lamb. And there were some visitors to the rich man. And rather than taking a, a sheep from his flock, he took the the sheep of the poor person, right? Who was like a daughter to him. And so, did you see? The, the story, right, that Nathan told is just a story, but they are symbols of what happened in reality. And it's, it's exactly like that in the book of Revelation, right? So you see, David is the rich man. He had so many wives, so many sheep. The, the, the poor man is Uriah, has only got one sheep, right? The visitor coming to David is his desire. So do you see the, the point? Revelation is like that. It's a story that reflects a reality. We really need to look through the story, uh, the symbols that are used in the story in order to see the reality. And then like Ezekiel, right? These are the prophetic use of uh, symbol in Israel. Uh, Ezekiel was told that his his um, um his wife will die, and he was not allowed to weep. Right, son of man. This is Revelation. Uh, sorry, Ezekiel twenty four, fifteen. Son of man, I'm about to take the delight of your eyes away from you with a fatal blow, but you must not lament or weep or let your tears throw. Groan quietly. Do not observe mourning rites for the dead. Put on your turban and strap your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your moustache or eat the bread of mourners. So in other words, he's going to take his wife 
but he's not going to mourn. The wife is the symbol of the temple, right? And her death, well, this is the this is a continuation of the story, right? I spoke to the people in the morning and my wife died. And you, but it, it's really, this is about God destroying the temple of Israel, which is like, you know, that's symbolized by Ezekiel's wife. And they will have no time to mourn because they will be taken on exile on the way to Babylon. They will be taken captive on their way. So there will be no one to mourn or to groan for the for the fall of the temple, the burning of the you know, the eyes, the, the, the desire of, of Israel's eyes, because they, they thought that the Lord would protect them because, you know, he lived in that house. Or like the parables of Jesus, remember? The wheat and the de and the tares, remember that, that parable from uh, Ma Matthew 13? So then when he came to uh, interpret the wheat, uh, the children of God, the tares are the children of the devil, the harvest, the judgment, where you know the children of the devil will be burned in hellfire, while the children of God will shine like the sun. See, symbols and used in the story, but has meaning. Okay, so the summary is this: we must look to the rest of the Bible in order to understand the symbols used in the Book of Revelation. So, I won't give you any symbols at the end. I want you just to write down the symbols as we go through and to write the meaning of it. Right? That's your exercise. That's the exercise. You have to listen. And you write down the symbols used in the, these stories, uh, and then um, um, you know at, at the end uh, you you interpret the meaning of them, right? Um, as I go, I give you the interpretation. You need to write them down. So Revelation one to eight, okay? Um, Revelation Jesus Christ, God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. <laughs> Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. John, the seven churches in Asia, grace uh, and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before the throne, and from Jesus Christ. And it continues on. Okay, So the book's clearly a revelation of Jesus Christ to his people, the believers, of what must soon take place. And we saw that. Jesus is about to come. The word of prophecy, which is the word of God, spoken about the historical situation of the first century, but with some implication of future occurrences because Jesus is not yet coming. Okay? It is also a letter to the seven churches. The seven is a symbol. Seven in Revelation is always a symbol of the whole thing, complete. Six, 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 six is total incompleteness. Okay? Six is, is the incompleteness, total incompleteness, 666, but seven is uh, it means complete or whole, right? So the letter to the seven churches means that the seven churches represents the whole church, the whole of God's. Now, some people say that there was one letter for each age, historical ages, like, you know, this is the age of the letter to, uh, I don't know. How do you know that this is the age of the letter? So it's, that is one of the misinterpretation of, the, of this book. There's the seven churches were real churches, but they real were real seven churches representing the whole of God's churches because all their problems, all the problems that they're facing, these seven churches, are the problems that we're still facing today, as we shall see, okay? So, um, you know, the time period from the first coming of Jesus is these last days. Remember that? So, Acts 2.17, and it will be in the last days, says God. Hebrews 1.1-2, 1, 1 uh, long ago God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and different ways. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. Or even 1 Corinthians 10.11, these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages. So we live in the end of the ages, the last days, or these last days, right? Now, God is the one who was and is and is to come. Now, this is the this is a, a name of God's only used here in the book of Revelation, okay? But um, but it's a reference to Exodus 3, 14, 14, um, 13, 14, 15. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you, right? So I am, he's always been. He was, he is, he will be, he, he will come, right? Because he is, right? 
he was there. There's no beginning. There is no end. Right? He is because he doesn't depend on anybody. Okay. He is on his own, right? He's independent on anything, doesn't depend on anyone. You see? So that is um so that is his um his his name here. The seven spirit before the throne, right? There's a seven the seven spirit before the throne. Maybe I'll just click on that and you'll come up on the side here. Okay? So it says that um that, that there are seven spirits before the throne, okay. Uh, from the seven spirits, verse four, okay. These seven spirits, as I said, seven is the number of completeness. So they are a symbol. The seven spirit before the throne is a symbol. Spirit, seven spirits, sorry. Not seven spirits, spirit. Uh, before the throne is a symbol of the completeness of the Holy Spirit. It just means the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in Revelation. Okay? From Jesus Christ, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Imagine how that is will be comforting to those who were um, persecuted by the by the Roman emperor, you know that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He rules over the emperors who are persecuting the church. It should be comforting to us because that means that we can ask Jesus to protect us from him or even we can ask Jesus to give us power to face the persecution from the rulers of the kings of the earth. Um, that is, even the kings who are persecuting believers, uh, you know, get, the God is in control of them. He loves us. Even during our suffering, that's what it says here in um, um, in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the king, to him who loves us. And they set us free from our sins. See? He loves us even in our suffering. We learned it from Romans as well. Since through our suffering, he is affirming to us, right, that we are his kingdom. You see that suffering is one way of affirming God, affirming to us that we belong to his kingdom. Okay, uh, this world, I mean, they they hate suffering. But we Christians, we love suffering because we know through suffering, through suffering, God is assured, give us, giving us assurance that we ourselves will be glorified through his son Jesus. Okay? Um, he's making us to be a kingdom through that suffering, kingdom of priests. And this is a reference, you know, the kingdom of priests, a reference to Israel in Exodus 19.6. You will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. These are the words you are to say to the Israelites, right? And this is applied to us by Peter, right? You yourselves, living stones, spiritual house, have been built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, so you see that um, he loves us. He's making us a kingdom of priests. That means we are included in the Israel of God, right? We're not replacing the Israel of God. We are included in it, okay? Because all the entitlements of Israel are given to us in Christ. He is coming on the clouds, that's Jesus. But I take it that this is a reference to his current status of ruling the world from the right hand of God. That is, uh, what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24, then the, son of the, uh, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That has happened in his ascension. But what must soon take place is he will appear. Okay? He will appear to be seen by all, and the earth will mourn when they see him whom they have pierced. God is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, this is from the Old Testament, from Isaiah. For he rules the universe from its beginning to the end. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Uh, alphabet. Omega is the last letter. So in other words, from the first letter to the last letter, God is always there, right? He rules the universe from its beginning to the end. So even our sufferings under control. As I said in the beginning, I believe this book is really about, um, you know, God's sovereignty in our suffering, uh, holding holding us on uh, until he returns. Okay, uh, Revelation uh, 1, 9 to 20 then. Um he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the affliction, um, kingdom and endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit. Okay. So he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's the first day of the week. And I heard a loud voice. Behind me like a trumpet saying, 
write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see uh, whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like a son of man, dressed in a robe with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery, uh, a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired uh, in a furnace, his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, a sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you see? So those symbols are already interpreted to us. Okay? The seven lamb, lamb stands are the seven churches. The seven stars are the seven angels of the church. But we'll look into that. Right? Okay. So John, the apostle, is partner in affliction. A kingdom, endurance that are in Jesus. That is, the church is enduring suffering. Okay. We are enduring. So they made the three major themes in Revelation. Uh, we believers are currently suffering because uh, of Christ. Right? We are. We we we. we I mean, we cannot deny that. I know your affliction and poverty. That's what Jesus said to one of the churches. Look, I will throw her and those who commit adultery and do great affliction. So there's also affliction for the sinners. For believers who had fallen away, God will afflict them as well, so that they might repent. But also, we are also, but these ones, the people who are already in heaven now, they came out of the Great Tribulation. That is, we are currently suffering, right? Some people believe the Great Tribulation will be seven years before the coming of Jesus. I don't get that from the Scriptures, okay? But what we know from Scripture is that we are currently suffering. We are already in the Great Tribulation ever since Jesus suffered in this world. He told us that we will suffer, we will be hated, Okay? Um, so we suffer, we endure. The second theme is that we endure, looking forward to the coming of Jesus, where the kingdom of Satan will be ultimately destroyed, right? When the, the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, 1210, um, the kingdom of our God has come, right? 1610, um, you know, the um, kingdom, see, the kingdom of darkness will be, um, you know, you will, you will suffer, uh, and it's the same with Babylon in the you know the ten horns and that all, all the evil things, you know, evil forces that are acting against us will also be afflicted, right? And I think already some are afflicted at the moment, and so we look forward, uh, we endure suffering, look forward uh, to the coming of Jesus. Therefore, we are summoned to endure till the end. So we will share the victory with our coming king, right? Um, so here I, I um, it says, uh, I know you persevered uh, and hardships do not grow, you have not grow weary. So we should not grow weary, right? Uh, I know your works. I know that your last works are greater than the, than the last. So we can see our growth, right? Um, that there is temptation that will be coming up on the whole world, which or I think you're already suffering right now. But there is a call for, for all of us to endure and faithful um, until the end. And then 14.12 calls for the endurance of the saints who keep God's command and their faith in Jesus. So endurance, you know, endurance through suffering with the hope of the coming of Jesus is really the message, the central message of this book. Okay? John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, in the spirit is a reference to a spirit empowering John to see the spiritual reality of the church as they gather for worship on the first day of the week. So do you see that's the vision that John saw, right? He was in the spirit because he was given power, right, to see the spiritual reality, you know, 
behind the gathering of the church. So this is the spiritual reality behind our gathering even on Sunday, right? And then you see what he saw? He turned and he saw uh, seven lampstands and stand, uh, and that's the, the seven lampstands, as I said, uh, you know, stands for the churches of God in any age, not the seven ages of the church as some hold, but the church of God in any age, right? He's represented here. The one like a son of man dressed in robe is the risen Jesus, dressed in high priest garment. So the robe that he's wearing is a symbol for us of a high priestly garment. Okay, So uh, I think it indicates to us because in Exodus 24, uh, the the garments they make, a breast piece, an effort, a rope, it's it's the you know, is the, the basic description of the garment that he's wearing. It's the same as the priestly garment that was made in Exodus, right? Uh, so he's standing in the midst of his church, dressed in um, priestly robe because he's the high priest of the church, right? He is our high priest forever. And he's standing among the lampstands, which are the seven churches, affirming his promise to be with us till the end of the ages. So that's a symbol as well, right? It's a reality. The spiritual reality is it. He stands in there, but how, what do we understand about That's his promise in Matthew 28, 20, right? Uh, you go and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. See, that's, that's what he promised. His hair, white as wool, white as snow, reminds John of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So that's the kind of symbolic thing that points, the white as wool, white as snow, points back to Jesus on the Mount of Trees. So Jesus is now seen in his full glory, right? The glory that he revealed on transfiguration, he was transfigured in front of them and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as light. But it also points to his deity as this is the description of ancient of days in Daniel 7, right? Uh, in Daniel 7, he approached the, the ancient of days and was escorted before him he was given dominion, but the explanation of the ancient of days is that his hair was as white as wool, white as snow, which means that now Jesus is revealed as the man, son of man, the divine son of man who stands in the midst of his church, suffering with them, sympathizing, sharing their suffering, partaking in their suffering. Okay? His eyes like fiery flame reminds us that his eyes are so pure to look at sin and to tolerate wickedness in the church. That's Hapagok chapter 1, verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, so you cannot tolerate long, uh, wrongdoing. So that's a symbol of that, right? Eyes like a fiery flame. I don't think we should think that it's a, there's a fiery fr a flame in his eyes, right? but it's like a fiery flame because the symbol of purity that he cannot tolerate looking at evil. His feet, like fine bronze as it is fired on a furnace indicates strength and stability so they are symbols of strength and stability um, his voice like the sound of cascading waters is referring to the presence of the glory of god in the midst of his people in the new temple of ezekiel okay so this is what ezekiel saw in his vision of the new temple when the glory of god came to the temple uh he passed through the waters of uh, Sorry, that's the, I think it's Isaiah. It should be Ezekiel. Sorry, <laughs> now that's a good verse as well. But um, uh, it should be Ezekiel um, forty-three, uh, verses one, uh, verse two, where it refers to the voice of God as He is present in His glory among in His temple. Remember the temple of God, the Ezekiel temple is fulfilled in us. We are the temple, right? And as we shall see. In chapter 22 and 21, a lot of these uh, symbols of that temple that Ezekiel saw is fulfilled in the new creation. So that new temple that Ezekiel saw in chapters 40 to 48 points to the new creation uh, where we will be with God. The seven stars in his right hand are the angels of the seven churches, but I take them to be the church leaders whose responsibility is to, re uh, to lead people to righteousness, right? Uh, it comes from Daniel 12, uh, verses 2, um, I think verses 2 and 3, um, because you see in verse, in verse 3, I think it says, um, those who lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever, see? And I take it's not only a reference to the leaders of the church who are meant to lead um, people to righteousness, but I think it's also a reference to believers, 
If you're a believer who is leading others to the righteousness of Christ, you are a star in the church. And I think the letters to the seven churches are to encourage the stars okay, to continue on. And you see, Jesus is holding on to us as we hold on to his word, as we hold on to the testimony of Jesus Christ until the end. And, and of course, uh, the, um, um, you know, it's uh, the angel, the angels um, are the ones who do his word, right? Psalm uh, 103 verse 20, right? The angels are the people who, who live, abide by the word of God. So that's, I think, are the, the, the angels. Some people think they're real angels, but I think, I think it's just, uh, it, it, it Daniel 12 verse 3 is behind it. The sharp double-edged sword from his mouth indicates the power of his word to build people and to bring destructive judgment on sinners. Because I don't think you should imagine Jesus coming with a sword out of his mouth. It's a symbol, right? It's a symbol of his word uh, that brings destruction, judgment upon sinners and bring constructed um, building up upon us, right? Isaiah 49, 2, he made my words like a sharp sword. Uh, Hebrews 4, uh, 1, 2, the word of the Lord is living, effective, sharper than any uh, double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of the soul, spirit, joints, and marrow, to able to touch the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see? So, we come now to the letters to the seven churches. So the structure of the letters is like that the Christ director of the race of Jesus is drawn from um, and then commendation, criticism, command and commitment to the church. So let's just go through the letter to the Ephesians. Right? Uh, it's from Jesus who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. That is, he is near to maintain those leading people to righteousness. I think partly they may have lost the sense of evangelism. They were just living as a church. They, they, this was a church that had the right doctrine. And that's the, the commentation. They labor and endure, like in Matthew 4, uh, 24, 9. Uh, you will be hated by all nations because of my name, but they endure. And they did not tolerate evil people, have tested false teachers, right? such people of false apostles, deceitful workers. They, they realized that they're false apostles and found them to be liars, right? Uh, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit. That's what John says. So this is how you ought to read the book of Revelation with the Old Testament, the New Testament in view. So they had the right beliefs. These people, they had the right beliefs. The problem was they have abandoned their love they had at first. So this is the love that, that is there uh, when when we first got married. So God, uh, you know, go and announce the record Jerusalem that this is what the Lord says. Uh, I remember the loyalty of your youth, your love as a bride. Right? You know, the first time we so we we really love Jesus, we want to read his word, want to hear him, want to see him, just want to be with him. Right? Just like when we first, um, you know, met our wives or love uh, or married our wives or husbands, right? They, they, they lost that. So the marriage has become something that you're just being there, but, you know, the, the love is gone. Right, so I believe that this is what happened in the church that James is talking about. James two fourteen to eighteen, because he said, "What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. So you see what James is talking about. The works that confirm our faith is our love for the brothers. Right? So they may have lost their love for Jesus and they lost their love for the brothers. Right? They kept the right doctrine. So eventually a church like that is like the, a, a church of dead faith. Right? They believe all the right doctrines, but they have no love for other people. Sometimes this is the this is the era of the um, reform reformed churches, reformed theology. So the command is to repent, do the work at first, right? Like in Hebrews 10, 32, remember the earlier days when after you've been enlightened, you endured hardships for the gospel or their lampstand will be removed. You see, there's no church of Ephesus now, so they probably did not repent. They have a, the commitment is to continue hating the practices of Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, this is what they believe, basically. Everything is permissible. That's what they believe. Everything is permissible. And so if everything is permissible because Jesus set you free, right, 
even uh, in Corinth, they knock off to the local prostitute because they reckon it's okay because you're set free by Jesus to do what you want. So that's the practices of the Nicolaitans. And then this, this is the promise that one who conquers will receive the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Remember, the paradise of God is heaven, right? Some people, I think, as we have a witness, you believe that um, paradise is different from heaven. No, paradise is heaven because the tree of life is in the paradise of God. And as we shall see, that's in heaven, okay, in chapter 22. So when Jesus said to the thief, we will be in paradise today, he means that they will be in heaven. And when Paul said that he was caught up in paradise, yes, he was there. He saw heaven. Okay? Now, the letter to the Shminer, Jesus, the first and last, the one who was dead came to life. Uh, so the first and last, uh, as I said before, it comes from Isaiah. For he is in control of the devil, who is testing the church with persecution. Even if they die, they will come to life. The commendations, their affliction and poverty, but rich and slandered by false Jews from the synagogue of Satan. Now, the synagogue of Satan, I take it that's where we live, the symbol of the world. The world we live is the synagogue of Satan. Or the other, sorry, the synagogue of Satan is a church where the word of God is no longer proclaimed. Because you see, this is, you are your father is the devil. You want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer of the beginning, does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature. So synagogue of Satan is a place where falsehood about the word of God, false false teaching is proclaimed. Uh, so that's what the synagogue of Satan stands for. The command is not to be afraid of what they're about to suffer from the devil. The devil is throwing some to prison. So the devil is able to afflict us. It's behind our affliction, but behind the devil is God, of course, right? He's throwing some and afflicting them for 10 days. So... Uh, ten days, a symbol of a short time. We shall see that. Um, so that there are symbols like that. There's three and a half days. Ten days is a limited amount of the short, only a short time, right? Um, as in two Corinthians, for our momentary light affliction. See, that's what our affliction is just momentary uh, and light, right? Um, maybe for sixty years or forty years when you suffer uh, you know, these afflictions. But for Paul, it's momentary and it's light. The commitment is to be faithful to the point of death. They will receive the crown of life uh, that is reserved for those who are longing for the appearing of Jesus. Okay? The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Uh, and of course, you know, the second death is where the E, the, um, that's where uh, all the, de the devil, the beast, the false prophets, Hades and death all be thrown into that, that second death. Now, the letter to the church in Bergamo, right? It's written from Jesus, the one who has the sharp double-edged sword, uh, whose word can transform the church. So, you know, it's important who the letter is written from. The one who has the double-edged sword, as we say, is the one who can transform them with his word. The commendation to the church is that they live where Satan's throne is. This is what I meant before. Satan's throne is the world. Because you see, John 12, 31 says, he is the ruler of his world. It was cast out when Jesus died on the cross. And 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So Satan's throne points to where we live in the world. Right. So you are in Honolulu. Uh, we are here where Satan's throne is because Satan is the ruler of this world. But this church were holding on to Jesus' name, refused to deny their faith. And um, even though some have died as martyrs in their midst. Now, the criticism of this, they have some who were holding on to the teaching of Balaam, putting stumbling block in front of God's people. Now, What's wrong with putting stumbling block? It's 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 the same as what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 8 to 13. That is, there was food offered to idol. And some people, I mean, we Christians who understand it, it's not something at all. You know, it's just a piece of meat, right? Um, it has nothing to do with the devil or anything. And so some people were eating, but there were some who were still weak uh, in their faith. And they look at uh, the piece of meat that was offered to idol and they see that as uh, something that is possessed by the devil. And so Paul says, food will not bring us close to God. We're not worse off if we don't eat. Um, 
And we're not better if we do it, but be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes stumbling block to the weak, right? Uh, so the weak is the one that uh, that will be stumbled. For if somebody sees you, the one who has knowledge, right, uh, dining, and that's what he's, uh, he's talking about, dining um, um, in the idol's temple, won't this weak conscience be encouraged to eat food of the idol? So the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Okay? Now, when you sin like this against brothers and sisters and, and wound their weak consciences, conscience, you're sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I'll never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother to stumble or fall. I think the contemporary example we can have is drinking wine, right? As I always say to you, wine is okay. The Bible has nothing with it. getting drunk with wine. That's the problem. But if you have a glass of wine, but don't do it in front of the Tongans uh, in weddings and things like that. Uh, it will be a stumbling block for other Christians, right? And they also, they have those holding on to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. As we said before, the Nicolaitans were people who were using their freedom in Christ to indulge in sexual immorality and other immoral things because they think they have been liberated by Christ from everything and therefore they can sin and not be affected by sin. So the command is to repent or Jesus will fight against them um, with the sword of his mouth. The commitment is that the victors will receive the hidden manna. Remember the hidden manna was the manna that was um, given to Moses to be put, uh, preserved um, in, the, um, um, in the Ark of the Covenant, right? So in other words, the, the food that was given that was uh, devoted to God will belong to the victors. So this is just another symbol, right? the hidden manna of the food that was given to God, the manna in the wilderness was given to God, right? So in other words, God's food, God's manna will be given to you. A white stone, well, I take it the white stone is a stone of witness, like, like Joshua. He took a large stone and set it up under the oak, okay? Uh, as a witness to the covenant he made with the people. Isaiah 55, 13 says, um, instead of the thorn bush of Cyrus will come up, instead of the prior mitre we will... This will stand as a monument for the Lord. So it's a, in other words, the white stone is a symbol of the testimony of eternal life, right? And a new name. No one knows. Now, whatever the name is, I know the surname. The surname will be belonging to the Lord, right? Because that's why Isaiah 45 says, this one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will use the name of Jacob. So another will write in his hand, the Lord's, or belonging to the Lord, okay? So that will be, our new surname, it will be belonging to the Lord, whatever it may be, Ma'afu belonging to the Lord or Teresa belonging to the Lord, we will belong to the Lord, right? That will be part of our name then. Thyatara, it's from Jesus, Son of God, the one whose eyes are like fiery flame, that is, he cannot tolerate um, too pure to tolerate wickedness, and whose feet are like prones, that is, he wants this church to stand firm in the truth, and also, he wants them not to tolerate wickedness. There's a commentation, their work, their love, their faithfulness, their service, their endurance, their last work greater than the first. That is, they've grown spiritually. So this is a church that has grown spiritually, right? Their last work, that is, the, what they're doing now is greater than what they did before. That's a sign of growth. But the criticism is this. They have women, women teachers, right? It's like the Methodist church. They have Jezebel who is a prophetess. So this is, I mean, the excuse of women teachers, women preaching. They said, oh, they were prophets in the Old Testament, so I'm a prophet. Or prophet speaks the word of God, so I'm just speaking the prophet of God through that. Okay? But that's the sin of the church in um, uh, Thyatira, right? They had women teachers, and these women teachers were also deceiving and committing sexual immorality. Uh, see, do you see that once um, women are teaching sexual immorality will come in the form of homosexuality. See, it's almost like it'll come hand in hand. Once a church accepts uh, women preaching, women teaching, and women ordination, sexual immorality, homosexuality will come, will follow it, uh, follow it. And that's what happened in this church. The command is to repent. Jesus will bring great affliction, but to the rest, he wants them to hold on to what they have. The commitment, again, is that the conqueror will receive authority over the nations. That is, he will have royal authority. You're given the morning star. The morning star. Remember, the morning star is not uh, Satan. Yeah. The morning star is the um, you destroy your nations. You've been cut down from the crown. 
it, it, uh, this is a prophecy against Tyre and, and Sidon in Isaiah. But I think in uh, Isaiah 40, 14, it's a prophecy against Babylon. Okay, uh, See, the, the morning star of Babylon will be cut down. But our morning star is Jesus, right? And the morning star here is the word of God, right? It shines like a morning star, rises in your heart, says Peter. That is, it's a sign of the Messiah, right? The Messiah is predicted to come as a star that will come from Jacob. Okay? So that's the church of Thyatira. They, they, they grow spiritually, but they have women teachers in them. And that was wrong. The letter to Sardis, this is a church that have grown um, in terms of what they did uh, for work. A lot of working that was happening in this church. There were a lot of people doing a lot of work, right? But Jesus, the one who has the seven spirits of God, they needed the Holy Spirit. That's why it's written from Jesus as the one who has the spirit of God. And the seven stars, that those who lead people to righteousness. That is, they need the spirit of Jesus and they need to lead people to righteousness. That's what they didn't do, right? So commendations, they're rabbited for being alive because of all the works that he's doing. This is like the Sessi Wesiliana. Very lively in what they did, but it is dead. Because the works are not produced from faith. See, Romans 14, 23 said, everything that is not from faith is sin. You see, you see the Wesleyan, they do all sorts of works, but doesn't bring it, they, they don't have faith in Christ, right? They have no relationship, no real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The command is to remember what they have um, they have received, that is the gospel, keep it, repent, uh, or he will come and call him unprepared. For the undefiled, so there were people who were still undefiled in their, in their clothes. They will walk with Jesus uh, in white, for they are worthy. So wearing uh, white robes for believers is the sign of being, the symbol of being worthy of heaven, right? You wear a white robe, you walk with Jesus, it means that you're worthy of heaven, right? Because you are, you are a victor, but not only that, but your robe has been washed in the blood of Jesus. The commitment, conquerors will be dressed in white. That's what, as, as I said, that's the, you see, that's transfigured clothes of Jesus. Whenever you raise his name, the book of life will be acknowledged before the Father and the angels, right? Remember, those who are not ashamed of Jesus will be acknowledged before the Father and the angels. Philadelphia. It's written from Jesus, the Holy One, the True One, right? So they need to continue on to be holy, to be true to Jesus. The one who has the keys of David, who opens and no one closes, closes, no one opens. That is, Jesus is opening opportunities for this church. And they really need to hold on to the word of God. So commendations that Jesus knows their works, has placed open doors before him. For she has little power, uh, but has kept the word and not denied Jesus' name. Okay? So he's kept the word. Uh, he has not denied Jesus' name. So there's nothing bad about this church. Commendations their enemies. And the synagogue of Satan will come and bow down to them. So I think the synagogue of Satan surrounds us today, right? The, the churches where the word of God is no longer preached or it's only preached partly, that's the Methodist church and other churches, okay? The people from, from there will come and join us, right? And this is, I mean, this is a promise for those of us who hold on to the word of God and not deny the, the, the name of Jesus. We should endure because, see, this is commendation is our enemies will come and bow down and will know that Jesus loved them. That is, they will come and join them, right? So the church will grow numerically. Commitment to Jesus, that Jesus will keep them from the hours of, te of testing. They have kept Jesus' word and endure. Let's hold on so that no one takes their crown. Conquerors will be made a pillar in the temple. So the pillar, remember the pillar of the temple? Solomon set up pillars at the portico of the sanctuary, he set up the right, um, the right pillar and named it Yakin, and uh, the left pillar and named it Boas, right? So they were the ornaments of the temple. In other words, we'll become that, right? The ornaments of God's temple in heaven. So that's a church. Uh, this this church is a church that I think we should be, our church should be like the church in Philadelphia, okay? We have no power. We don't have a lot of money, but we hold on to the word of God, but we don't let go of, of his name. And uh, we continue in that. Okay? Um, the conquerors will be made pillars. And so the pillars are the symbols of us being the ornament of God's temple. And then lastly, the church of Laodicea. Uh, from Jesus, the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the originator of God's creation. That is, this church needs new creation in Jesus. 
They need Jesus' originating power and creation to originate, to, to restart them again, to renew them, to regenerate them. Okay? Commendation is that their works are neither hot or cold, so Jesus is going to vomit the church. Criticism is that they boast. on So this is a wealthy church, right? It's like most of the churches around us. Methodist church, uh, they boast in their wealth, but they are rigid, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So the advice is to buy from Jesus gold refined in fire. I take it that's a symbol of faith tested by persecution. 1 Peter 1 7. Proven uh, so that the proven character of your faith, right? White clothes which have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, that's the clothes of those who've been washed in the Lamb. So they need to be washed in the Lamb. Again, see, they haven't been washed in the Lamb. So there's no forgiveness. They haven't experienced the forgiveness of Jesus to wash their sins away. Uh, they need ointments to spread over their eyes. I take it it's godliness. The person who lacks these things is blind, short-sighted, has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. So in other words, they really need their eyes to be open. They need um, you know, godliness, that is the promises of God. They need the promises of God to open their eyes, right? So that they will be able to see heaven. And the commitment is this. God is committed to disciplining them, right? Uh, as in Hebrews 12, 6, of the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. So they are to be zealous and repent. Right? As many as I love, I repent, and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Jesus is standing from outside the church and knocks for he wants a personal relationship with believers. See? He went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. See, Peter was uh, accused of having fellowship, intimate fellowship with uh, Gentiles because he went to the house of Cornelius. It's the same as Jesus wanting to come and eat with us, right? Uh, so he's standing outside the door and knock, right? And uh, those who will be conquering um, will be with him on his throne. So, Father, we thank you so much for these three chapters. We pray that the symbols will help us um, to be will encourage us, especially... You as the son of man dressed in your white robe and your priestly robe, standing in the midst of the lamb stands, holding uh, in your on your right hand the seven stars. I pray that they will encourage us, that you are with us, that you are holding on to us, those who are leading others to righteousness and those who are holding on to the word of God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that this will be an encouragement to us for today as we continue on to endure hardships until you return. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.